Yeah, and welcome to all of you. I'm delighted to be here to introduce tonight's speaker. The highlights of Leslie Adrian Miller's career are really most impressive. She's widely traveled, a highly recognized scholar and professor, and above all, a critically acclaimed poet with her sixth collection of poetry titled Why, coming out later this year. The title of tonight's presentation, The Resurrection Trade and Other Reflections, is taken from her 2007 poetry collection of the same name. I have been fascinated by the resurrection trade. Some of the poems in the book are deeply personal. Others come from another time and place and are embedded in the fantastic, the macabre. The majority of the poems are ekphrastic in nature, confronting the color prints of female bodies done by the 18th century French artist and entrepreneur Jacques Fabien Gautier or Gautier Dagoti. The subjects of these illustrations were often destitute young women whose bodies were stolen or sold before being flayed, dissected, and rendered into visual images. The poems Miller has written in response to the images are dense mosaics of science and art. With the eye of an art historian and the curiosity of an archeologist, she unearths the assumptions the illustrations reveal about women and their bodies. Miller also challenges the irony of the artist's attempt to give the color printed images what he called an air of life by painting the flayed bodies with heads that had been untouched, showing lovely faces and stylish coiffures, like you see right here. Miller is frank about this beautification, reminding us that a woman whose body is being drawn was, after all, a corpse, a cadaver. Her poems serve to remember these women in another way, through language, by describing their bones and muscles sensuously, beautifully, while also being just as attentive to the privations and sufferings they endured. Interwoven with the poems about the resurrection trade are others, personal, tender, and sometimes disturbing, drawn from the poet's life. I especially like the poem, Up North where Miller imagines the dead weight of her own body as her lover pulls her into the woods on a sled. Prone, I see no more than branches clasped above. As she imaginatively composes her body, we're reminded of the way Dagoti posed and arranged the women he drew. But here, Miller is conscious and in control of the heft and power of her body. When she refers to the, bal excuse me, to the ballast and balance of her inert flesh, we marvel at her self-possessed strength, especially as it contrasts to the mutilated, objectified women whom she's come to know so intimately through Dagoti's images. These are not easy poems. They force us to read and reread with care, to read as if we were ourselves peeling back layers of detail to see what's inside, to see how the poems work. The poem's imagery will surely stay in your head. And if you're as curious as I was, you'll be happy to know, if you're curious about the scientific and aesthetic context of the prints, you won't have to jump off and do research of your own. You're going to see more of them tonight, as I was driven to do on my own. Miller uses a line from Geoffrey Chaucer to introduce a poem titled Mantra of the Bath. It's a lovely meditation on a child just learning to name his world. I suggest that that epigraph could serve as a fitting invitation to the book itself and to the power of what it reveals. It reads, this thing that has happened to you is for your instruction and your profit. We have much to learn from tonight's speaker and her poetry. Please join me in welcoming Les Leslie Adrian Miller. Well, thank you all for coming out on such a beautiful night to take a look at these images and listen to some poems. Um, what I've done is sort of written up uh, a lecture and embedded the poems in it. So I'll read a little bit and then I'll move to the poems. And at the end, hopefully, you'll be interested in seeing the images on which the poems are based. Uh, I don't show them first because there's no context and um, because they'll just make you more curious, so hopefully the poems will give you some, some background. I've called this Science into Poetry, the Writing of the Resurrection Trade, and it's a little bit about the journey that I took in writing the book. 
Poetry and science are often thought to be radically opposed disciplines. Science claiming the realm of hard fact, while poetry plants its flag in fancy. But at the level of language, the differences lie primarily in the audiences for these texts. Audiences who come to the task of reading with different purposes. Science readers come for information. Poetry readers come for enchantment. The late Miroslav Holub, Czech poet and immunologist, writes in his essay, The Science of Poetry, The Poetry of Science. The basic difference between the emergence of the scientific theme and the poem theme is the notion and necessity of purification, definition, and linearity in the former, and the notion of necessity of the openness, ramification potential, and multi-level interaction in the latter. The scientific theme implies as much light as possible, the poetic one as many shadows as possible. The gap between the audiences for these disciplines may be wide, but as Holub's essay goes on to point out, the practitioners and processes in these disciplines have much more in common than most of us assume. For the poet, the gap between these specialized audiences is precisely what makes borrowing from science so fortunate. Aside from the obvious fact that the scientist sciences offer the poet seemingly endless novelty of subject matter and refuge from excessive subjectivity, bringing material across the science-poetry divide can give us access to new metaphors, fresh and concrete images, novel conceptual approaches, and names for things we did not previously know we needed to name. Science and poetry may seem far apart in the present cultural moment, but they've not always been so. And recent work in the history of science has invited us to consider some of the shared territories and cross-fertilizations of the sciences and humanities. Most importantly, I think, both science and poetry attempt to pry open new dimensions of the ineffable and to provide us with fresh ways of observing that with, which has become so familiar we no longer question it. To illustrate these parallels, I'd like to talk today about how I came to write the poems in the resurrection trade and to share a few of the images gleaned from the History of Medicine archives on which this book of largely ekphrastic poems on medical images of women from the past is based. Uh, ekphrastic poems, by the way, it's a phrase that means speaking picture, and they're poems that are based on an illustration. I'll give you some background on the project, stop now and then to read poems, and then at the end I'll show you some of the images. When I wrote the earliest poems in this collection, I was pregnant with my first child. And like most first-time mothers, I engaged in lots of reading about what was happening to my body as my pregnancy progressed. I was fascinated with the giant science experiment my belly had become. And so I kept reading, well after the birth of my son. One of the most engaging of these texts was Natalie Angier's Woman and Intimate Geography, a book that takes each different part of the female body and provides a detailed and simultaneously amusing and horrifying history of each body part. Of course, Angier is one of our finest science writers and is particularly good at rendering scientific information in an accessible and lively prose style. It was in Angier's Woman where I first encountered this fascinating history of medical images of the female body. For example, there I found a description of Leonardo da Vinci's anatomical works, medieval views of the female uterus as horned or floating around in the body, and the Hippocratic corpus of writings with its amusing prescriptions for curing female problems. Angier's text did not include images, but she did describe and reference many that were very easy to locate in my university library. And at this point, I'll, I'll read you a poem called Wandering Uterus. And um, I can tell you that it, it was thought for a while that the uterus 
did wander around and end up in different parts of the body, and that was why women um, got strange. Um, other things that are true, uh, their part come from the reading of the fact that Leonardo da Vinci for a while believed that um, semen actually came from the brain. And you'll see in some of his drawings that there's a, there's a direct line <laughs> running, running through the body. Of course it came from the brain. Where, where else would it come from? Um, and there's some other amusing facts. And again, all of these were, were drawn from um, early medical texts. Wandering uterus. Leonardo believed that semen came down from the brain through a channel in the spine. And that female lactation held its kickoff in the uterus. Not as bad as Hippocrates, who thought the womb wandered the ruddy crags of a woman's body, wreaking a havoc wherever it lodged, shoving aside more sensible organs like the heart. All manner of moral failings, snits, and panics were thus explained. The wayward organ floating like Cleopatra's barge down the murky canal of any appendage or tying up at the bog of the throat. One can't help but imagine a little halved walnut of a boat like that in Leonardo's drawing, the curled meat of the fetus tucked inside harboring near a naughty eye or rebellious ear that never can hear what a man might mean when he says yes or always. It's all still beautifully true what these good scientists alleged. The brain is as good a place as any for the manufacture of evanescence. And why not allow that the round and sturdy skiff of the uterus may float and flaunt its special appetite for novelty, even if we dub it dumb, lined with tentacles, many chambered and errant as the proverbial knight, seeking out adventure, but loyal to one queen. Yes, they thought it was had tentacles, all kinds of things. Um. <laughs> Another one of these early poems that um, comes from Hippocrates, uh, who um, did a lot of writing about um, female troubles, um, which it's pretty amusing to read this stuff. You can look it up. It's, he's pretty much all online these days. And he had some very inventive cures for female troubles. Uh, and the end of this poem is pretty much entirely stolen from Hippocrates. It's a recommendation for what you should do if you have female troubles. And the poem is called Recipe for Couples Therapy. Would that my husband had read Hippocrates' Nature of Woman, especially that bit about dislocation of the womb. Who knows what sets it off? The poor old tire deflated by some entirely benign remark happens all the time to those of us in late middle age. I myself can't even count the number of times my parts have gone over to the liver in the last year. And then it's true. My voice is simply toast, nothing but a muffled sob and the dull broken record of one's suffering scrapes to a stop. Oh, if only we had that sweet scented wine on hand or known just what foul-scented vapors to torch beneath my shorts. Eventually, Hippocrates believed pregnancy would cure such naughty waftings in the groin, but it didn't work for me. And then there's the real zinger, when the womb heads for the hips. You'll know it when you see, he said, the mouth of the womb turned to the hip, and then it gets complicated involving all kinds of things that are pretty hard to locate. Undiluted sheep's milk, fennel, and absinthe, right where the panty hamster smiles. Then you've got to find squills, opium poppies, and rose perfume, four cantharid beetles with their legs, wings, and heads removed, four dark peony seeds, cuttlefish eggs, and a little parsley seed in wine. And when you finally start to bleed, he advises, live it up, gal, get it on with your man, and be sure to eat some boiled squid. 
<laughs> Can you imagine <laughs> following such advice? Angier's book led me to other more detailed histories of art, anatomy, and midwifery in Europe, and from the medieval period through the 19th century, where I found fascinating poetic material, particularly in anatomical drawings of women included in medical books. As I exercised my curiosity about these drawings, the men who made them and the women who inhabited them, I found that the more I read, the more I needed poetry to traverse the gaps among the disciplines of art, science, literature, and history. I became interested in the way misunderstandings about female anatomy persist long after science has presumably corrected them. And I found that these under misunderstandings offered paradoxes that poetry could reframe in interesting and even humorous ways. And yes, you, you're allowed to laugh when you find funny things in these poems. I also needed to find a way to contextualize my own experience of childbirth and motherhood outside personal experience. So approaching this material through the history of anatomy was one way to achieve more aesthetic distance. In these poems, I've appropriated details from Middle Europe's history of gynecology and medical illustration and tried to reconstruct gaps and revelations in concert with my own experience. My academic training and experience as a woman found a common ground in this work. My method in constructing these poems was a liberating combination of scholarly research and poetic imagining. My research into European medical history surrounding women's experience of childbirth led me to historical depictions of pregnancy and the female body in art and science. The rise of anatomy schools and fascinating works on the resurrection trade, which was the business of grave robbing that grew up around anatomy schools and the impact on the lives of women and families in 18th century Europe. And the next piece I'm going to read is called Rough Music. And it's, um, find it here. These events that it's based on take place in uh, Edinburgh, Scotland in 1829. There was a um, famous grave robbing case, and I think there's even been a, a, a movie made about this. I saw it advertised. <laughs> it looks like a really bad movie about um, Burke and Hare, um, who were two uh, guys who, who realized that um, they, they were robbing graves, and they realized that it, they probably could murder a few people and make even better money um, because they would have fresher corpses. And this was a time in, in England when anatomy schools were, were going great guns and they were promising the medical students that they should all have their own bodies to dissect. So they had to get them somewhere. Um, the medical school or the anatomy school was run by one Dr. Knox who he, he sort of got away with his crime. Burke and Hare did not. Um, and to this day, Burke's skeleton is displayed in a case in, <laughs> in Scotland. It was part of his, um, uh, I guess, he, he was, he was uh, flayed first, and then um, his skeleton was preserved for medical science um, as a kind of <laughs> revenge for the, the uh, people he killed, and, and particularly he killed a woman named Mary Patterson. Um, so a lot of that comes out in this poem. Rough Music, Edinburgh, 1829. I should say rough music, too, is what, what the Scots did uh, when they disagreed with somebody. They'd show up in front of their house and bang pots and pans and make lots of noise, and it meant you did something bad. Why shouldn't Dr. Knox have invited his painter friend to view the body of the girl he knew was too fresh for a legitimate death. Her handsome limbs, an alabaster waist, a crime to cut before at least one brush could render her unscathed on paper. Had she been any less an odalisque, perhaps he wouldn't have needed to collude with artists or waste good whiskey to keep the cream in her hips, her purpled lips all the more arresting than they'd been in life. If he'd found her sooner and living, would he have known all this was there for purchase? 
Would he have offered to keep her in dresses and tea for peaks? In the weeks after Hare turned King's evidence on Burke, and the latter's convicted corpse was flayed and offered up to 40,000 pairs of public eyes, Knox refused to speak. Though by report, she'd been delivered to Surgeon Square still warm, and clutching twopence halfpenny, someone paid to bed her. They cut her hair before she cooled, and Mary swam three months in whiskey before they took her skin apart to look inside. When the story broke, an angry mob came after Knox with noise, an opera of whistles, pots and pans, and tore his effigy to shreds in Newington outside his house. And if, in Mary Patterson, a child had taken root, no one would be the wiser if Knox had kept the little lyric of it to himself. Seeing fathered by the Scottish city's lust, gift to men of science, and so also to me, woman of the new world, digging through old books to resurrect her murdered parts, to offer her my own rough music, the strange collusion of imaginary science and real art. The other detail there is the fact that, in fact, they did preserve her body in whiskey, and it was, um, instead of formaldehyde, fairly useful way of doing that. Um, in addition to my reading in these various subjects, I made use of online image resources at libraries that specialize in anatomical and medical history, and eventually visited a few to examine the archival materials available. Um, these would be the National Library of Medicine's online dream anatomy exhibition, and that's where I found this cover image. Um, it was really one of the first of Dagoti's, in fact, it was the first of Dagoti's images that I saw. Um, and he became, the artist and also his images became really central to the collection. But it wasn't until I actually went to the um, Library of Medicine in Paris that I found the bottom half of this picture. It's a fold-out, kind of like a Playboy fold-out. And this is what's interesting about these images, Dagotis in particular, and it's, people are still studying these images, but they're not entirely sure that they were made exclusively for medical reasons. Uh, the people who could afford to buy these books, they're handmade, of course, hand-colored, very large, expensive, would have been well-off gentlemen who might have uh, enjoyed looking at the bodies for other reasons. And again, it depends on who you're reading, but there's still a lot of ongoing research about um, why these images seemed so popular with, with well-off doctors. I found Dagoti an engaging subject because he was primarily a visual artist by training, but he specialized in medical drawings and he did his own dissections. So he had to have a pretty good anatomical knowledge and he had to take the body apart as he was making these images. Um, he also um, had a copyright on this mezzotinting process that makes them look kind of pretty. He also wrote, which fascinated me a lot, rather apologetic notes in the margins of a lot of his drawings, presumably because he understood the grisly nature of his work. He interested me because he was really living in this art-science divide. Was he a scientist? Was he an artist? He was really both. And that divide really in the, in the 18th century is fairly interesting. Not much is known about him other than the fact that he made these drawings and etchings. Um, he inherited some of these mezzotinting techniques from his father, who also was a medical illustrator. So I had to read a lot more books to create a context for this guy. And I'll read you the poem called Gautier da Gautier's Écorchés next. Écorché is the, the French word for these drawings that don't have any skin on them. Um, it's a word that basically refers to stripping bark off of a tree. Um, and it's come to be the name for any of these anatomical drawings where the skin is taken off. And this starts with a, a little bit of mythology, but I think that's self-explanatory. 
What have they done to deserve this beauty? Did they, like Marcius, invite some knife-wielding god with, twin, with petty transgressions, the crime of a few tunes on Athena's lost flute? Or were they simply too poor for deep graves, locked gates, and good husbands to watch over the mounds of new soil tossed toward them and their hunted unborn? Whoever they, are, they were, they're still with us, posing demurely in suits of blood and muscle, the bruised shadows of what skin they do have, purpling like crushed petunias as they spread their legs and raise their meaty arms to show dissected breasts, unfinished infants, sundry viscera on the ground about their feet, as if this were Thanksgiving, and they cornucopias stuffed with squash and fruit. And who delivered their sentences? Surely not the muses, who at least let them keep Rococo faces. In 1773, the womb and brain were the last outposts of the body to be mapped. Dagoti bought the rights to Leblanc's technique of printing mezzotints and gave these ladies homes in scientific texts. But anatomists believed Dagoti's prints too gorgeous to be accurate. Perhaps that's why they open other wounds so easily in us. They're all so like the single rabbit I downed at 20 with a borrowed rifle and then was obligated to see skinned, first a scoring the length of the spine, then the peeling of the fur in one steaming piece while the perverse uncle, who clearly desired to touch me, instead held up a dripping pelt in one hand, and in the other, a flayed carcass still wrapped in its bundle of muscle like a gift. Other medical artists and anatomists who specialized in rendering the pregnant female body were working in London and Paris during this period. For example, William Hunter, William Smelly, Jan van Remsdijk, all of whose work is well documented in the Hunterian Museum in Glasgow and the Wellcome Trust in London. Though there were significant differences between the French and the British medical systems when it came to childbirth. The English surgeons largely kept childbirth in the charge of men, while in France, a highly developed system of midwives had developed for handling birthing and the medical images generated in both cultures had significant differences. Um, and after looking a lot at, at a lot of this kind of image, I was very happy to find um, the work of Madame de Coudre, uh, who, believe it or not, was hired by the King of France to go out into the countryside and help women um, in childbirth give birth to their babies because the king of France was very worried that French babies were dying in great numbers in the countryside. And of course they were. Um, it, hygiene wasn't what it is now. And uh, what's so very interesting about Madame de Coudre, um, she lived a long time. She traveled around to villages throughout France and she had the good sense to figure out that most of the women she was working with were illiterate. They couldn't read medical texts. Books like this wouldn't be any use to them in trying to help each other in childbirth. So she invented what she called her machine, which was a model, was really one of the first models of a, of a female body. And she sewed all the parts. She made it out of bones, wicker, wood, leather, and cloth. And she had baby models that she could then give to these illiterate women and help them figure out how to safely get a baby uh, born. And this was revolutionary and probably is one of the reasons that France is still on the map, <laughs> frankly. Um, so I'll read you her poem. And she was a real relief to find. It's called Madame de Coudre's Woman Machine, 1756. And it starts with a quote from uh, a biography of her. I perfected an invention that pity made me imagine. Um, and that, that's her herself. And it starts with a few references to some of these other uh, medical um, 
illustrators. After Dagoti's macabre écorches and Rimsdick's tendency to coil his innards tight as bags of fists, and then to paint a fatty sheen on every part. I gasp out loud when I find Le Boursier's soft machine of linen and leather. The woman's thighs, great hams of rosy fabric, gathered at the knees like parlor bolsters. The plush swell of belly draped in a modest apron and opened in a V that all who would deliver her might see the fine embroidery of the wrinkled vulva giving way to the crowning cloth doll. One puffed umbilical cord to announce life, another flat to advertise a death. While Dagoti's sexy écorches live on in countless volumes, only one of Madame du Coudre's machines for instruction in the art of birth remains. This one, with its wicker bones and wooden pelvis, replaces her original, which tucked a gate of real pelvic bones inside the giant cushion. Sundry detached pieces lie about, the pillowy placenta as if infused with water still, the warning of a crushed and severed infant skull to show the damage of an unforgiving tug. She made her mannequin of cloth for the women of Clermont who couldn't read, much less afford Dagoti's illustrated books, who worried more about the warming of the wine and butter in which a living child was cleansed, or the sturdy shoes the dead would need for traveling hard, dark roads to nurse their babies from the grave. She listened while they spoke of prolapse, mangled parts, torn limbs, and broken backs, the ragged, filthy fingernail of someone's helpful aunt or neighbor tearing the sight from a child's eye. From these tales, she fashioned her machine, pushing her needles through the flesh-colored cloth as capably as she pushed her hands, merciful and clean, into the darkened rooms of a thousand unupholstered wombs. And she did discover that hand-washing would be helpful. And it's part of the reason she had such great success and for so many years. This next poem is related to that one. And it's a story that uh, I found rather amusing on the other side of the channel. Um, and again, as I said, there's, uh, there's a great deal of difference in the way childbirth was handled in France at the time and in England. Um, and uh, in England, it was being handled mostly by men. And they didn't have a real good idea of what was going on inside the woman's body, um, which is how a story like this could come to happen. This is called Mirabilia, which means a miracle. And it's a story in 1726. A woman reportedly gave birth to rabbits, baby rabbits, lots of them. And um, this was a great sensation. They brought her to the court. They examined her. They are like, wow, she's giving birth to baby rabbits. Um, and you might ask, how could that happen? Well, it, it could happen because the male doctors weren't that sure what was really going on inside. And I have some pictures, too, of uh, the courtroom because there was a big court case. The local doctor took her for a gloomy sort, a little daft but strong. Her husband worked in cloth and got on her three live young before this last most curious brood, a whole tribe of rabbits springing forth in groups of three or four. Harvest in Surrey being nearly done, maybe that year only meager store, leeks and turnips, a few thick-skinned gourds. Perhaps they'd been a little short, but rabbits were abundant, and her boy, able in getting litters young and whole enough to plant in Mary's lap, her roomy burrow readied from easy passage of three prior infant skulls. The village was ready, too, for some miracle of birth, even if it was just rabbits coming on with winter's chill. But by her own report, Mary took a longing in the field one day when a rabbit sprang up like a bright idea from the dying Queen Anne's lace and giant fennel. So her five weeks child afloat in the womb fell away that night with a dream. These blind and skinless babies 
curled in the child's lost place, and drank of her waters, waited for light, and a man midwife ready with belief. Even after churching, more rabbits fell from her marvelous loins in Gulford, so the English court brought her into town to have a look. And though they finally caught the serving boy with pockets full of blind and slippery bunnies, and trundled Mary Toffs off to jail after her confession, the fact remained that she had fooled at least a half a dozen educated men by simply being what she was, mammal, mystery, cave and warren, unmapped womb, a woman. I love that story. I think it's funny. Um, kind of sad, too, but funny. Ludmilla Jordanova, in her book, Sexual Visions, Images of Gender and Science and Medicine Between the 18th and 20th Centuries, writes that medicine bears an especially ambivalent relationship to the public-private dichotomy. It's rooted in the latter, yet makes claims in the former, a situation that explains the predisposition in medical writings and representation to the breaching of taboos. When I read this passage, I understood clearly for the first time just why this subject is so potent for poetry. Poetry, too, has to navigate that odd dichotomy between public and private. Forged in the intimacy of an individual's mind, a poem is a private act destined for a public audience, a reader, a total stranger. And so the process must go both directions. It's both the oddity and the appeal of poetry that it can be at once so intimate and so public. As I wrote these poems, the book evolved with a focus in the 18th century, and this is where the real crux of issues reside in medical constructions of sexuality. It is a period of enlightenment in the Europe that brings anatomical studies completely into the same frame historically with the construction of gender. It is also during this period that the medical care of women passes from midwives, women themselves, into the hands, quite literally, of male doctors. Gross misunderstandings of female anatomy, comical and tragic, persisted well into the 20th century. And uh, the, the book does close with a poem from uh, about 20 years ago, which uh, some of the very last things to be figured out about um, the uh, body have been quite recent, more recent than you would think. I was trying to use very specific stories and details to get at larger interdisciplinary issues here, namely the intercourse or lack thereof between art and science, medical practice and science, history of gender as we find it written on the collective body of women. In addition, let me say that the archivists and teaching doctors at the Clendening Medical Library in Kansas, the Anatomia Collection in Toronto, and the Rouvier Museum in Paris, as well as the National Institutes of Health History of Medicine Library, were all part of this great adventure. The archivists at these institutions were eager to share what they had, and they led me to new images and welcomed a poet in their midst something I did not expect. My poems borrow freely from these sources, and I hope serve as invitations to the reader to seek out these authors whose work resonated with me both intellectually and emotionally. The next piece I'd like to share is, um, is called Anamnesis, and it comes from uh, a book, partly um, several books, but I, I looked at Barbara Dudden's book um, first, and she led me to uh, this Dr. Johann Stork. Um, he wrote a book called Diseases of Women. It's eight volumes. Can you imagine? Eight volumes, Diseases of Women. He's a German. Um, seven of the eight volumes are devoted to case studies of women that he attended uh, over a 20-year period, and there are 1,800 cases in uh, that book, uh, 1,650 different women. That's a big sampling for this time period. Um, what's interesting is that Stork's books were all written in the vernacular. He was actually recording what these women were telling him, which is not what other medical professionals were doing. They were working with Latin for the most part. 
And according to Barbara Dunn, and this is a quote, I, lo I love this quote, and again, you're invited to find this amusing. Stork himself listed the following factors for the success of his practice, his medical practice. Divine providence, his skill in women's cures, to which his own wife was walking testimony. For as he dryly remarked, divine dispensation has given me a woman from whom I could learn more than from hundreds of other patients. For up to her 61st year, she was laid up 15 times with this disease, pleuritic fever, Eight times she survived illness in childbed. Twice she had cold fever and jaundice, and she often suffered from hemorrhoids. Ten years she spent complaining about stones, not to mention other inherited hysterical misfortunes. That's a, that's a direct quote from the doctor. Um, <laughs> um, so I've read uh, some, of, some of his cases, and I took language out of these women's mouths and sort of collaged a lot of this language. And um, that has, it starts with a little epigraph from Barbara Dutton. Pain is inside the body. It leaves no trace for the historian unless complaints about it are recorded. Um, and again, this is the first time that things had actually been recorded in the local vernacular. After the French Revolution, the trend in figuring anatomy was largely to dispense with heads. And later still, the lexicon of maladies began to pale. But Johann Stork's 1,600 women still have their tongues and readily report a tearing in the jaw or a rising in the throat. This one has a cold womb and that a womb fear. Another claims a squeezing in the heart. Frights drive blood deep into the chest, a mouse, a drunken spouse, fireworks, or children got by ghosts, an infant's color, cough, or trouble breathing, spleen fear, heart full of stilled wind, stone colic, knots on the buttocks, heat in the feet, fright in the limbs, one shrunken breast or womb cramp manifesting in the mouth. But anger adheres to the stoutest heart, knocks to get out, an urging in utero, a rattling in the belly, stirring in the arm, breath and speech flying out the ears, wind turning toward the womb, and eating at the breast, heavy tongue, flux and fits of the evil thing, beyond which whatever can't escape lives on in the fisted heart of the child and the child's child as a big trouble with wind. I just love the language that I was looking at there. Antique medical drawings interest me on many levels. As the production of working fine artists, they say something about art. As the tools of medical professionals, they say something about how we came to understand the physicality of the female body. As images which necessarily were almost always accompanied by text, they also have much to say about language. Hence, my deliberate mistranslations of notes I found in French accompanying the drawings, notes which seemed to me to say much more than the authors intended, and in combination with the images, allow us to look again at how science and art have been co-conspirators in the construction of gender in the West. And I think I'm going to end with a poem called Cherries. Um, which kind of goes back to the very beginning, and this is something we all um, know. I can find it. See, I had all these nice little markers. And that's the fact that women when they're conceived, have virtually every um, egg they will ever have. And men, on the other hand, only make it up as they go. <laughs> and so it occurred to me, um, especially ha having a child so late in life, that um, I was lucky enough to have had him there all along um, from the beginning. And uh, it's no accident that um, it, I mentioned um, Auvergne in this poem, 
uh, Cherries because Auvergne is, is one of the places where Madame de Coudray also worked. Cherries. Rocked in my mother's pregnant amble and born into 45 years in the dark. The egg this child was also swayed in the arts of lovers I took before you. Fed with me in the public markets of Baltimore and Den Pasar on oysters and rambutan. Woke with me each year to new waves of wander, fish and flower, liquor of each region, bread of each village, each cup of moonlight in a long sward between my window and the Vanzi. The egg he was heard the voices of everyone I desired and held itself in some deep hormonal bloom, taking whatever was remarkable in my life into its possibility. We learned not to hurry in Balinese rain, to listen for the rumble of wild boar in the Malvin woods. We climbed into plains bound for cities we'd never visit again, and skin we would summon with sobbing. And so, my husband, as you dream of owning this child, remember that he has ridden in my fire, bathed in my blood, sipped at the breath I drew the first time I saw what Rodin had clawed from stone before he turned from Claudel and went home for dinner and a clean shirt. Remember that this child is collage of everything before you, frangipani and escargot, five four dollar boxes of macaroni, and French cherries from an old woman in Auvergne who insisted on the gift because it was so marvelous to see a woman traveling alone. Now what you've really been waiting for, you wanna see these pictures. I'm gonna take you quickly sort of through them. This is the cover image and this is one of the medieval drawings <laughs> of the uterus. You can see the horns. You can see that they thought that they thought the human beings were sort of fully formed and dancing around inside of them. Oh, it's going too fast. Um, this is one of Da Vinci's drawings. There's another one. You can see these images again were pretty directly described in the poems. That looks like a little walnut shell. This one is. Uh, this one actually was hard to find because I teach at a Catholic university and somebody had cut it out of the book. I had to go to another library and find it. Um, this one, as you can see, there was this period of time when they liked to uh, use floral motifs <laughs> in medical drawings. Um, and and uh, that is an early one. These are the harder ones. Um, these are some of the famous ones from William Hunter. This one I, I like a lot because you can see that there's a book. They decided to put a book there. Here's the, here's the, the alternate picture. And I suppose you had to pay a little more to get this one. Um, this is the cover to the Degoti book, which is a long, as I said, book with the fold out pieces. And that's the cover. There's the bottom half of that first image. Um, as you can see, it's not terribly accurate anatomically, but it is kind of grotesque and beautiful at the same time. And he's taken all the other anatomical parts here and kind of disembodied them and left them lying around. Um, and there's the full view. And again, I, it just astonished me because I had seen that other image over and over again online and even in, in books, because these books were eventually sort of ripped apart and the pages were sold as, as art. So archivists have had to put them back together. And when I found this and I was sitting in the library in Paris and I folded it, I went, oh my gosh, she does have legs. Um, and they were all fold outs. And there actually is one of these that is on wood, which is life size. Here's a, a, a detail and there you can see See all this little writing at the bottom? This is where he kind of apologizes for what he's up to. Um, and again, this is, this is a guy who's doing his own dissections, painstakingly, you know, piece by piece, and drawing it as he, as he does so. Um, there's her bottom. So they, they all, these were all fold outs, essentially. 
again, you can see they're not really medically very useful. They're odd. There's some oddities in them. He, he, how could he know what he was doing, really? Um, they, they take as much from art history of the period as they do from science. There's the child. Um, this is a Hunter's atlas. You can see that he, he just took the, the midsection. And these are the ones that look so much like ham to me. Um, and again, he decided just to dispense entirely with the, the rest of the body and do the, the torsos. This one, um, I didn't read the poem that goes with this one, but I, I like it. She is in a museum in Paris, and she um, actually breathes. You turn her on, she has, it's a machine, and she's wearing this beautiful lace Victorian nightgown, and she goes, <gasps> it's, it's awful. And there's all these weird disembodied hands all over her. And again, these were supposed to be, I guess, m models for childbirth, but they sure seemed to have other overtones to them to me. Um, th this is to illustrate some of the various ways they, they were trying uh, to figure out how to get children out. It was, it was a big problem if, if you had a, a pregnancy where they were um, turned around, couldn't get them out. Um, so they were developing various tools uh, during this time, and again, most of the tools were developed in in England. For, these are these are all from uh, Hunter. And again, Coudray's machine solved all these problems. She's taught women, you know, how to put their hand in there and get the head out and do it safely. Um, it's not not rocket science. Uh, it does require you know a little little knowledge of you know where the baby's going to be. This is another one of Dagoti's images. Um, she's the one called the Flayed Angel. This is Madame de Coudray, <laughs> a nice, nice country French lady. Um, and there's her machine. Uh, as you can see, it's, it's crude, but it's built with, she had a model for twins. She had a different models for the, um, uh, the umbilical cord because that would tell you something about the state of the child. She had um, the uh, size was right in there, and she even used a real pelvis bone so that they could figure out exactly how to get the head through safely. And when I gave this slideshow at um, a, a medical school in North Dakota, they were amazed. They were like, this, these are pretty accurate. And these, these were people who delivered babies um, in, in modern times. They were kind of amazed these existed so long ago. This is in the Flaubert Museum where you can see it. Um, and she had, again, all of these pieces. She made everything herself. That is an x-ray of it. You can see the, the real pelvic bone that's buried inside all of her nice needlework so that they could figure out exactly what angle to get the baby's head through. And there's another piece of the model. I have a lot of these. There's what happens if you've got twins. Um, they're so nicely sewn. I just love these. There's, there's to, they, she needed to be able to show the spine, so she used um, what she had, springs, various things, because it's important not to break the spine, of course. And this is, again, an x-ray of her, her model that she made. And I go, I have rather a lot of these. This is also in the Flaubert Museum. It's a, it's a funny, uh, sort of cartoon of, of how medical exams were done and gives you some sense of why doctors did not know what was up in there. This is one of Hogarth's Prince of the Rabbits. You remember I read you the poem about the rabbits? Um, there they all, you can see them, there's the rabbits all running out from underneath her skirt. It was a popular cartoon. Um, <laughs> Because, uh, you know, they were made fools of, naturally, by this. And it was, it was big news. Um, there's another one. Um, to all the rabbits around, they're just, they're just running right out of her skirt. <laughs> um, these are, from the, these are um, from the very last poem in the book. And um, this is coming from uh, uh, an um, MRI image, which actually shows uh, it wasn't until, <laughs> this is sort of funny, in the Netherlands they decided uh, in, I think it was the late 1980s, 
one weekend that they, they were going to finally figure out once and for all what happens to the uterus during coitus. Nobody knew what happens to it. Does it move, you know, like, like they thought? Um, and they, they couldn't figure out how to do this except with MRI uh, imaging. Um, but they couldn't get people to climax in the machine. It was, it was just not, they couldn't figure out how to do it. So they hired a couple of acrobats. <laughs> I'm not kidding. This is science, right? And if this is a real study. And they got these acrobats to actually do it in the machine. And lo and behold, they found out that the uterus does move. As you know, it's the, that it was took until quite recently. And they discovered that. And there's another image of it right there. Um, and that's